We've been enjoying this series. Has the Lord been speaking? Yes. Amen. Well, he's going to continue to do so. I'm excited to move further into the book of Ephesians. This has been great, and God's going to continue to grace us through the word and to build us up. Amen. And so we're going to continue, and we are going to go back to Acts. There's a lot in Acts. There's a lot in the book of Acts leading into the epistle. But we are going to touch Ephesians chapter 1 tonight. (laughs) Acts chapter 20. And so we've we've been studying uh, the book of Acts, and we've learned a lot as it relates to Paul's, um, his ministry journeys and his, his, his missions that he's been on and the third part of his missionary journey, he, he planted this church here. And so we, we saw the miracles that took place and, you know, all the souls that had been saved and the, some of the warfare that they had to endure. Uh, Paul, Paul left, and uh, he calls the elders of Ephesians to him. And so they come to Paul in Acts chapter 20. We're going to pick up at verse 17. And we'll see what the Lord has to say to us on tonight. Verse 17, we'll read through through 38. When they arrived, he declared, the elders of the church of Ephesians, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I've endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. I, 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 I know, I, and now I know, that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I have declared today I have been faithful. I'm going to read that again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out! Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you day and night. And my tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. I'll read that again. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad, most of all, because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 reads, This letter is from Paul, chosen by God, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Who are what? Faithful followers of Jesus Christ. So we're, we're in this series on, on the glorious church, and that's what we are all a part of. Last week, the Lord really helped us to understand that a glorious church is, is, is a disruptive church. And this week, the Lord wants to help us to understand that the glorious church is also a faithful church, a faithful church. Father God, we thank you for the reading of your word. God, we thank you, God, that your word is rich and your word is alive, God. We thank you, God, for continuing to speak to us through your word. All that you say, we will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I got a chance to go um, minister for my father on Sunday. Um, I wasn't here with you guys, but uh, still in the body of Christ, still in the, the, the local church of the tri-state of Cincinnati. Um, so there is a local church. There's a universal church that we're all a part of. And just having some conversations with uh, some of his pastoral staff, um, we, were, we, were, we were talking about Karis Church. We were talking about uh, my father's church, which is Heirs Covenant Church. Uh, we were even talking about Shiloh and the Kitely Legacy. And, you know, one of the things that just came to, to mind as we were talking, Pastor Patrick, is that God is moving in all of the churches that are his churches. And it is a privilege, it's an honor to be a part of the, the, the local church, to be a part of this, this body of believers that God has chosen to, to, to insert his will in the earth. And so I was just reflecting on the different ministries that I've been able to be a part of and just um, the, 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 the wonderful opportunity to be a part of what we learned last week was called the, the ecclesia. We looked at Matthew 16 and we, we broke down what Jesus was referencing when he made mention of building his church. And that word, just as we recap, ecclesia is E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ecclesia, which, which in the Greek just simply means the called out ones. And so when Jesus decided to build his church, he's the chief cornerstone, he calls us out to be a part of this wonderful body of believers, this community uh, called the church. And some of the scripture references we looked at, as we just kind of recap, we, we understand this concept of being called out. We looked at Abraham, who was called out uh, in Genesis chapter 12. Israel was called out of Egypt. Um, we saw Judah was called out of Babylon. And the New Testament church was called out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and that's what we're a part of. We're called out. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different nations, different lineages. Um, we have different um, um, uh, so, uh, so, sociological um, differences, but we've all been called out, and the Lord has brought us together uh, to be a part of his church. And so we looked at uh, what it meant to be called out as a body of believers, and we saw in First Peter 2.9, that the church has been called out of darkness. Amen? And we also saw in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the church is called to a vocation. We saw in Ephesians uh, 4, verses 4, that the church is called to a calling of hope. And so there's these various callings or, of the church being called out that we referenced last week. We also saw in 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, the church is called to a holy calling. Amen? And we saw in Philippians 3, 14, the church is called to a high calling. And we know that famous scripture there, Paul referenced, where he says, Brethren, I don't count, it, count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call, in God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so the church has a high calling. The church is called to a heavenly calling. And we saw that in Hebrews 3, verse 1 and 2. 
the church is being called into eternal glory. First Peter 5, 10 and 11, and the church is being called to his kingdom. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. And so the Lord spoke to us last week concerning a, a, a disruptive church. And what is a disruptive church? We gave the definition of, of what it meant to disrupt, which is to prevent something, especially a system, process, or event, from continuing as usual or as expected. And so the church, being, being us who are called out to be a disruptive church, we're called out to prevent something, especially a system, process, or event, from continuing as usual or as expected. And so we saw all of these disruptions happening, happening in Acts chapter 19. We saw where, 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 where Paul was just preaching the gospel and people were being healed, people were being saved, and all of a sudden, it started to shift the economic system that was in place in the city of Ephesus. And so the, the money and the resources that were going to, to the demonic kingdom was no longer going to a demonic kingdom because there was a church that was willing to disrupt the economic system. Amen? And so as we recap before we move into today's teaching, uh, the, Lord, the Lord shared with us that a disruptive church cannot be bought. A disruptive church is not a church that is going to be uh, bought by the enemy. We're not making side deals. We're not compromising on what it is the Lord has called us to do in the earth. A disruptive church cannot be bought. A disruptive church has a binding and loosing ministry. Jesus, Jesus taught us that in, in, in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, he said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And we saw this binding and ministry, uh, this binding and loosing ministry in action in Acts 19, where Paul is actually, is, is, is goes into this city, he's binding these principalities, these principalities of perversion and idolatry, and he's loosing these people into the freedom that God has called them into. We, 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 we also see that with, 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 with Lazarus, when we, when we see that Jesus raised him up, but Jesus did not loose him. Jesus did not loose Lazarus. He, 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 he told them to loose Lazarus and let him go. And so the church has a binding and a loosing ministry uh, that is connected to a disruptive church. Also, a disruptive church robs the enemy of his influence and in worship. And so that was one of the things that uh, Demetrius was so scared of. He said, he, he said uh, Princess Diana or Artemis, which was, is the other name, is, is, is going to be robbed of the, the, her influence. But when a church is on mission and when a church is doing what it's called to do in, in the city that it's called to do it in, it's going to disrupt the powers that be. There's going to be some influence that the enemy loses, and there's going to be some wins on our side. And so a disruptive church robs the enemy of its influence and its worship. Paul had an issue. He's like, y'all worshiping these false gods. There's only one true God. There's only one living God. And so when we are on mission, we are pointing people back to Jesus. A disruptive church is a sober minded church. And so with all of the distractions happening, with all the riots happening, with all of the chaos that can be going on around us, we're sober minded. We're focused. We're not, we're not, we're not thrown, uh, tossed to and fro by what may be happening uh, in the news, what may be happening uh, in society. We're sober minded and we're focused. We're not confused. We're not worried. We're not in fear. A disruptive church is a sober minded church. Amen. And a disruptive church is mission-driven. A disruptive church is mission-driven, and we, and we saw that. Paul was focused on the mission. It was saving souls. It was getting people healed. It was getting people delivered. And as he was doing that, God was touching their lives, and the church was continuing to grow. And the Scripture makes it clear in Acts 19.20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, mightily and prevailed. And so as we move into this week, what we're going to be talking about on tonight is a faithful church, a faithful church. And as I was looking at Paul's last encounter with the elders there in the book of Ephesians, the Lord began to show me some things. As we kind of move into um, 
chapter 1 and verse 1 of, of, of Ephesians, what we have to understand is that Ephesians is one of the four prison epistles. Paul was on house arrest for some time, and he wrote these letters while he was in prison. And you can reference that in Acts 28, 16. But uh, you had Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And so Ephesians was written in A.D. 60, and it was really considered to be a, 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 a circular letter. It went to the Ephesians, but it's, been, but it's been written that it went to probably all the other churches in Asia Minor. Pastor Patrick and I were talking on the phone earlier today uh, around a, a, another idea that we may dive into as it relates to um, the, the letter and it being sent out to these various churches. But it didn't cover any doctrinal issues. There weren't any problems going on in the church. If you look at Corinthians and some of the other books, uh, Galatians, things of that nature, Paul wasn't, he wasn't setting matters straight. What Paul was really doing was helping us to understand all that God did for us and how we should be living our life and expectation that we should have as, as children of God being brought into this family. And so when you look at Ephesians 1, chapter 1, it opens up. It says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's holy saints, or holy was the word, interchangeable with saints, people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we see here with this opening is that Paul knows exactly who he is. Paul knows exactly what he was called to do and who called him. As an apostle, that word apostle just simply means sent one. He was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, and this speaks to his authority that he carried in the earth. And so he references not just who he is, but, 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 but who he was sent by. And so anytime there's a calling on your life, that calling must be confirmed. It has to be confirmed. Even Jesus had a witness who was John the Baptist. And so you'll find different times where people, they want to move into ministry or they feel like they have a platform ministry, but they have no witness. They haven't been tested they haven't, they, 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 no one's laid their hands on them. They have not been sent. But Paul had been sent by first the Lord Jesus Christ, but then also his ministry was confirmed. This is important, church. Ananias in Acts chapter 9 was a confirmation. There must have been something in Barnabas' spirit because he took him to Antioch to the believers in Acts chapter 9. The Holy Spirit confirmed Paul's calling in Acts chapter 13, we read that when he and Barnabas were sent out. Peter accepted Paul in Galatians chapter 2. And then also the church of Jerusalem recognized Paul as well in Galatians chapter 2 as well. But here is the interesting thing about what Paul said, opening up this book to the Ephesians. He uses the language here. He says, who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Right? So they're faithful followers, they're believers of Christ, but he's also saying that, that, that they have fellowship with one another, fellowship in Christ, right? So he mentions the word faithful, but the only reason Paul could say they were faithful because they had his DNA. So when you look at the passage that we just read, we go back up to verse 26, and this is where we're pulling this thought from on tonight. He says, I declare today that I have been faithful. So how does a church become a faithful church? First and foremost, they have a faithful leader who was Paul. And Paul infused his DNA into the city of Ephesus and the church of Ephesus over the course of the three years he was there. He was an example to them, and he couldn't teach what he was not willing to live. He couldn't teach what he was not willing to live. And so when he writes this letter and he admonishes them, he says to the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. He says that because he was faithful in serving them in that city. So what does it look like to be a faithful church? 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, Paul also says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And so, and, and so Paul understood this idea of what it meant to be faithful and the importance of a church remaining faithful. And so 2 Timothy was the last epistle Paul, had, Paul, Paul wrote. And this is the language that he uses as he's penning his last message to the church. We also see this here in verse 31 and verse 35 that I read as well. He says, remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day and many and many tears for you. Verse 35, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. And so we get to Paul's farewell letter per se, which, 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 was, which was very emotional. It was very emotional. They knew they were never going to see him again, but it just wasn't emotional. There was a lot of wisdom in here, there was a lot of instruction in here that Paul left to the elders, the leaders. Sometimes we look at this and we're just thinking elders are those who are, who, who, are, who are the pastors or those who have the platform. But I'm talking to leaders here on tonight. Amen. And so Paul leaves a recipe to the church of Ephesians on how to be a faithful church. So let's look at the ingredients of a faithful church. He says, when I arrived... He declared, you know that from the day I set foot in Providence, Asia until now, I have done the work, the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. A faithful church walks in humility. A faithful church walks in humility. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, this is a trustworthy saying that everyone should accept it Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example in his great, great patience and even the worst sinners. Paul himself, with all the accolades he had, knew he was the worst of the worst. He knew he was one of the worst sinners to ever walk the earth, the way he persecuted the church. But Paul moved in humility. With all of the degrees, Paul could have probably been a lawyer. He, he, could have, he could have worked in any profession he wanted to. But Paul worked in humility. He, he operated in humility. And if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to walk in humility. We can't be a place where people say, no, you don't want to go down to that church. They don't accept people like us. They, 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 they don't like our kind. They talk about people that look like us. If we're, going to, if we're going to be the church of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to walk in humility. We can't be the, we can't be the church to say, well, well, they know it all over there. You go over there, then you're not going to be, in, you're not going to be accepted. They don't, they don't like our kind. Paul preached to the Jews, and Paul preached to the Gentiles. He said, I become all things to all men that I might win one. He walked in humility. A faithful church walks in humility. The second thing you see in verse 19, he says, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. A faithful church has compassion. A faithful church has compassion. Mark 1 verse 41 says, and this is Jesus. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. He said, I'm willing, he said, be healed. He was moved by what? Compassion. Matthew 9, 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 14, 14 reads, Jesus saw the huge crowd, and as he stepped from the boat, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Do we see a theme here at all? In Luke 15, 20, it says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was, filled, while he was still a long way away, his father ran to him coming, 
filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and he kissed him. And so a faithful church is filled with compassion. We cannot forget where we were when the Lord found us. We cannot forget how our lives were jacked up. We cannot forget how, how sinful we were. We cannot forget how, 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 how crazy, some of the crazy thoughts we used to think and how we used to lash out at people, some of the anger issues we used to have. We cannot forget where the Lord brought us from because the moment you do, you lose your compassion for others. If God's ever healed you from anything, when somebody is sick, you should have compassion for them. If the Lord's ever touched your body, you should have compassion for them. And we see that all through Scripture. Paul moved in compassion. A faithful church has to have compassion for people. There's going to be people who come through these doors who are dealing with issues, things that you could never imagine. But the heart of our Lord and Savior had compassion for everyone. And if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to be compassionate and want to save souls. We want to see everybody come into the kingdom. Amen? And so a faithful church is a church that walks in humility. A faithful church is a church that is compassionate. And a faithful church is a church that endures trials. We see that in verse 19. He reads on. He says, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plot of the Jews. First Peter 1, 6 through 9 says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him. Yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. James reads in chapter 1, verse 2 through 5, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. A faithful church must know how to endure trials. We must know how to persevere and to push through the trials of the enemy. The only reason Paul could declare that to the church of Ephesians, because he was an example to them of how you could be faithful. And he was training them on how to be a faithful church. There's going to be trials. There's going to be things that we have to endure, but we cannot draw back. We have to press into God and to move through those trials. It's interesting here in verse 4, it says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, there's the connection. He gave you the cure, right, that most of us in our trials, we complain, we gossip, we're calling people on the phone about what's going on in our life, we, 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 we're mad at God, we're mad at other people. He, he, he makes it very clear here. He says, but let patience have its perfect work, because patience is doing something in our lives we don't like it all the time. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, Verse 5 does not say, if any of you lack something. He gives us the answer to help us move through our trial. Raise your hand if you walk through a trial before, you look back on what God brought you through and realize you just need a little more wisdom to navigate that trial. Paul says when you're going through a trial, you just need more wisdom. And so ask God for wisdom when you're going through that trial and it can help propel you or push you to the next level that God's called you to. And so a faithful church must learn how to navigate and deal with the trials that come. Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me 
you may have peace. But in the world, you will have tribulation. That, that word tribulation simply is thripsis. In the Greek, it means pressure. He says, you will have pressure. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The problem with some of us is that we start off on fire. We start off excited. We start out with energy. We, we, we start out declaring the word of the Lord and everything that God wants to do in our lives as a church. But then we, in, we have to endure some pressure. There's some pressure on the job. There's pressure in the family. There's internal pressure. There's external pressures that come upon us. And all of a sudden, we begin to shrink. And all of a sudden, we begin to question. But if we're going to be a faithful church... We have to endure the trials that come before us. Amen? Amen. And so Paul is teaching this to the church of Ephesus while he is there over the course of those three years. That's why he could go back to them and said with all of the I statements that he made. Because he was a model and an example to them as to how to be a faithful church. Amen? Verse 20 says, I never shrank back. From telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes, a faithful church must stand for the truth. A faithful church must stand for the truth of God's word. Paul wasn't, he didn't lie. Paul wasn't sugarcoating nothing. And he said, I told you what you needed to hear in private and in public. You can't be one way here at Karis Church, but the moment you get in your car and you drive down the street, you a whole nother person. We cannot be two-faced. And Paul says, I didn't shrink back. I told you what you needed to hear. I was the same with you in a public setting, and I was the same with you behind closed doors. And so a faithful church has to stand for truth. And so, so when you're in private settings with people that think they know you and, 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 and you're tempted or you're tested with things that do not align with God's word, you have to stand for truth. The problem with some of us is that we end up falling and we kill our witness. And Paul says, I was a model for you in public and in private. When I was in your home, I was the same as I was in public. If we at the mall together, I'm, I'm the same there as I am when we're at the house. And if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to be a church that stands for truth, not just in here. We don't just worship when we're at church. We worship when we're at home. We don't just speak well of God to our neighbor here. We speak well of God to our neighbors on the street that we live on as well. And so a faithful church must be consistent. We can't be one way here and another way outside in the street. And sometimes it comes down to a hard word. Paul had to give hard words sometimes, and sometimes we have to receive hard words. Jesus speaking to his disciples, and this is, this, this is one of the, 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 the toughest words that they had to receive in John chapter 6, 53 through 60. And Jesus is speaking. And so the scripture says, so Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person up at the last day for my flesh is true food. And my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, but live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And many of the disciples said, this is a very hard, this is very hard to understand. Who can accept it? But if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to stand for truth even when it's a hard word. And that's what Paul is saying to the, to the church of Ephesus. He says, 
Look at me as an example of how I was faithful with you. This is how you're going to have to remain to be faithful even when I'm gone. There's going to be some truth that we live by that society's not going to li- live by. The word of the Lord is the word of the Lord. And we don't have to apologize for the word of the Lord that we live by. Can I get a witness in here on tonight? Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We can't shrink back from the word of God. Holiness is still right. Fornication is wrong. Sin is wrong. And if you don't turn and accept Jesus Christ and repent, there is a place for you. It's called hell. That's a hard word for some people. But Paul said, I did not shrink back. With all of your witchcraft, with all of your wrongdoing you were doing here in the city of Ephesus, with all of your wild orgies and all the times you went to the temple, I would minister to you. Every time I saw you, even though you didn't believe, I would continue to minister to you until you believed. And so there's going to be times where we have to give a hard word, but you cannot shrink back from it. And Paul is saying, if you're going to be a faithful church, follow my example. We even saw this with the rich young ruler that came to Jesus. He comes to Jesus, and quite frankly, he tells Jesus, man, I done did everything you, 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 you're saying. I've kept all the commandments. He says, sell everything. He walked away sad. But he didn't, he didn't shrink back from telling him what he needed to hear. Some of you have a word for a family member right now. Be a faithful church and tell them what the Lord is saying. Speak the truth in love. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, loving not our lives even unto death. There, 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 there is a word in your mouth. There is a, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge that you can share with a neighbor or a coworker. You cannot shrink back from telling people what they need to hear in public and in private if we're going to be a faithful church. Amen? Amen. Verse 21. I have had one message for Jews and Greek alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. And so we see the key word here is and. We see it twice. Paul says, I've had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. A faithful church preaches one message. A faithful church preaches one message. And this is simply here just the the first principles of Christ. But we're not wishy-washy on the blood. And you can't be wishy-washy in your faith concerning what Christ did on the cross. Because if you half-heartedly believe it, you'll half-heartedly live it. And you'll wonder why you're not stepping into the abundant life that Christ came for us to live. And so Paul says, I preach one message to you. And it's the same message that he introduced in Acts chapter 19 when he ran up on the believers who had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. So what when we look at this scripture in chapter 21, where would they have fallen? They would have fallen right here at the necessity of repenting from sin. The baptism of John. But Paul took them further. Amen. Amen. And turning to God and having faith in the Lord Jesus. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to God. And Paul comes to a city where they were worshiping multiple deities. And we live in a day and time.
Amen. And so a faithful church preaches one message. There's one way to salvation. Amen. There's not multiple roads. And Paul ran into a people and a community that thought there were multiple ways to get to God, multiple ways to, to get to heaven, multiple ways to live the abundant life that God has called us to. And there's only one way, and his name is Jesus. And so as a church, we have to preach one message. As individual believers, it's only Jesus. It's not Jesus and Muhammad. It's not all this mixture. It's not Buddha. It's not all this stuff that we see out in society. It's not horoscopes. It's Jesus. It's not signs. It's Jesus. It's not these other deities. It's Jesus. Paul said, I preached one message. I was consistent. And if we're going to be a faithful church, we must be consistent. Amen? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. I know you don't like it, but you got to go through Jesus. He may be offensive to your lifestyle and how you want to live, but you cannot live however you want to live. And so Paul warns them, and he's telling them, you've got to watch. You've got to be mindful. But there was a certain sect of people that we'll talk about at a certain time that came into the church and started to wreak havoc. And so a faithful church preaches one message, verse 24, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. I love some of the language that Paul uses. It's like he fell in love with this word work. If you, if, you, if you study Paul, his letters, he uses this word work a lot. He, he must have been a, work, a workaholic. He was, he, he was doing tents and all this other stuff too. But he says, I have to finish this work. A faithful church is single-minded. They knew who they worked for, and they understood the job description. I'm going to say that again. They understood who they worked for, and they understood the job description. He says, to finish the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Even Jesus said he had to be about his father's business. And so a faithful church is single-minded. Yeah, there will be other initiatives that we do, there will be other things that we launch out and do as a church, but we are single-minded and focused on the gospel and the good news of the grace of God. A faithful church must be single-minded and keeping the main thing the main thing. Everybody likes to look at LeBron James and all these different spinoff things that he does, these movies, this production company. Hill Spring Productions that his business partners run with him. The only reason LeBron could do all of that is because he kept the main thing the main thing, which was basketball. And so as a church, as a believer, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. We have to be single-minded in our approach, which is the message of the gospel, which Paul categorizes as a great work. A great work. Amen? And so we also see here in verse 29, he's warning them now. And I love this. He says, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and try to split the church. That's not what it says, but that's what it means and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. It's interesting because wolves don't always have the microphone. Can we, can we just park here for a minute? So the, the wolves don't always have the microphone. I'm going to tell you what they have. They got three or four text threads on their phone talking about people. Wolves don't always have the microphone. But what do they do? They come down the aisle, 
They join the church. They go through life at Karis. And then all of a sudden, you in the corner with them. And I don't, I don't know about what Pastor preached today. What 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 you what do you think about that message? Oh y'all y'all don't y'all don't want to say nothing. Wolves don't always have the microphone when they creep into the church. Oh girl, did you hear? No, no, listen, I just want to I'm telling you because I want you to pray. Can we can we come in agreement and, and pray about some things? See, what I heard was wolves don't always have the have the microphone, but 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 they creep into the church and they start having side conversations and 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 and, and we've known each other for some time and so we, we we know at the church in Oakland there was a lot of uh pulpit pastors or 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 pew pastors we called them that knew everything about everybody and they were they 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 were talking amongst the members the 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 wolves don't always have the microphone but they're amongst the members they're they're, they're 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 amongst the crowd and they're and and they're talking about things that don't need to be talked about and Paul's saying watch out because the wolves come and they say yeah you know um i just feel led you know the lord's called me to uh start a bible study but you know the only night i can do it is wednesday night can you come see 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 wolves don't always have the microphone and so Paul and so Paul is is warning the church and I, I believe I'm talking to some mature saints here at Karis Church we have to make sure that the wolves don't get into the flock I can't hear nobody on tonight the wolves get into the church see where I come from we believe this see see that, that that's wolves trying to get into the church See, I thought the gift ceased after the, uh, the, the, the apostles' age. Y'all speaking in tongues? Wolves getting, getting into the church. And so Paul's warning them in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, he says, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The wolves don't always have the microphone. Most of the time, they don't. They're in the pews. And they're amongst the members. And they're sowing seeds of division. And they're gossiping. And they're stabbing people in the back. And so Paul is warning the church, a, 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 a faithful church is a discerning church. A faithful church is a discerning church. Amen? And so we, we, we look at verse 35 here. Is this okay on tonight? He says, I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus that is more blessed to give than it is to receive. A faithful church cares about the poor. A faithful church cares about the poor. And Paul was an example of that. Matthew 25, 35 through 40, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. You can't argue with him. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did you ever see me hungry and feed me or thirsty and give me something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did you ever see me sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And Paul was being an example to the church of Ephesus on how to be faithful and how to support the poor. 
And we saw, we, we saw that a couple Sundays ago. Pastor discerned that this young lady was in need, and what did we do? We gave. We helped her out in her situation. And so this isn't always picking up the phone and calling the church. When you see someone in need, when you can help them, that is what a faithful church does. And that's what Jesus says. And then lastly, I want to read this here because this is very, very critical. This is verse 36. It says, when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. A faithful church loves one another. A faithful church loves one another. And, and, and one, of, one of my greatest desires, one of pastor's greatest desires, is that we understand that we are brothers and sisters. That we are family. That is the beautiful thing of the church. That we are family. And I know we come from different natural families, and it all it looked different for all of us. But the more we study the scripture and we see how the church interacted with each other, it is our example to understand that that's how we are to interact with each other as family. As family. And so I want to come back to that verse in a minute, but I want to read this here because Paul, he, he speaks to this even further in 1 Corinthians. He says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth, of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a nosy kong and a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Jesus says this in John 13, 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. So I want to read that verse again, and then we'll see what they did. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. And they were sad most of all because he had said that he would never see them again. They escorted him down to his ship. So a faithful church loves one another. They prayed with him. They wept with him. They embraced him. And they walked with him. They prayed with him, they wept with him, they embraced him, and they walked with him. Amen? A faithful church loves one another. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, Paul made it very clear. He said, I, 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 I've been faithful. And he walked them through every example of how he had been faithful and what a faithful church to look like, not just there in the city of Ephesus, but how we can be a faithful church today here in the Western world. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the word on tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray, and then I'll have pastor come. 
gracious Father, we're just grateful. We're grateful that you called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you've chosen us to be a part of your ecclesia. You've called us out to be a part of your church, Lord, to help leave your imprint in this earth, Lord, to expand your kingdom through the church, through us, Father. And for that, we're thankful. Lord, I ask right now, God, that you would touch all of us under the sound of my voice, Lord. That, God, you would help us, Lord, to continue to be faithful. God, that you would give us the supernatural strength, Lord, to be who you've called us to be, Lord, in every sector of life, every mountain, God, that you have put us on in society, Father. Allow us to stand up and be your church in the earth. If there was ever a time in the earth where your church needed to arise, it's now, Father. And so I ask that a fresh wind would touch all of us. Encourage us. Give us the boldness to stand and to not, to not shrink back. To be consistent on a day in and day out. To be a witness, Lord, here in the earth. That your kingdom come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven through your local church, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together on tonight. Come on, let's put our hands together for the word. That was, that was rich. I was sitting there thinking just now, I was like, this is better than some Netflix we're binging on Ephesians, some program that you watch, and this is, this is rich. I just want to thank you for putting in the time in, in what you're doing in preparation um, because it shows, and it's powerful. I was just, you, you had me walk into the boat with Paul tonight because, you know, I was thinking... And come back up here. Come back up and let's talk for a minute. Can we get him another mic? Can we get another mic? Real quick. Somebody run back there and get. Oh, you got? Okay. We oh, got another one. Thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, there we go. No, I, I, yeah. I was, you had me walk into the boat. Yeah. It was like a, the end of a movie where Paul. He was there in Acts 19 and set this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. He set it up proper. Yeah. From He was there from the beginning, and then he had to move on. Yeah. But that was apostolic ministry. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and so I was just like walking to the boat, but he set it up because then he put Timothy mm -hmm. in as the pastor. Yeah. And he didn't lose contact, but he was not going to see them again. It was quite a scene. <laughs> yeah, so I mean... We, we've been talking about, we, we almost have some conversations because this, this stuff, you know, what we're talking about with the church of Ephesus is it's us. Yeah. And, and God wants to do this work in us. He wants us to be uh, a faithful church. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we, we were talking and even kind of leading into the series, it was so important to lay the foundation of the city of Ephesus, what was going on spiritually, even how the church was even planted. And um, just to see how the Lord orchestrated Paul's steps, how they set the church up. And so as we move into the book, we're, we're even gonna be able to see why Paul gave the revelation there that he gave. So much of it was in 19 and 20. And so it's just powerful. It is, it's just powerful. It is because what did the church become? It started off in a very difficult place, but what did it become? It became the hub for a multiplying church movement yeah. mm -hmm. that would literally touch an entire region called Asia Minor. Yeah. And, and so the content here, God's doing something. He's maturing his church. Yeah. One of the meanings of the name Ephesus means fully mature. And that's what we were, part yeah. of our conversation yeah. today was... Yeah. This 
can we just say it? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> part, yeah, yeah, yeah. part of the conversation today was this letter was written to two churches. And most people don't realize this, but scholars, it's called Ephesians. Or, but it was written to the church of Ephesus, but it was also written to the church of Laodicea. And so you have mature church versus lukewarm church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same letters being written to both. Yeah. And it's how you respond, how you receive what kind of soil. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of yeah. soil? We had the conversation. What kind of soil do you have? Is, it, is there weeds on the ground? Is it stony ground? Are birds catching it up? Or yeah. is this good soil? And we want to be good soil. And so you have wow. two different soils. Mm -hmm. When you look at this, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, that yeah. was part of our conversation today was actually scholars say this book was sent to two places yeah. at the same time. It's powerful. So, yeah, it yeah. is powerful. <laughs> so you look in Revelation chapter 2, mm -hmm. and you have the, church, the, the, the message to the angel of the church of Ephesus. And then in Revelation chapter 3, the seventh church, the first church is Ephesus. The seventh church yep, is Laodicea, church. Yep. and Laodicea was the lukewarm church. And so, same letter, same letter, same, same. content, mm -hmm. different ears, different reaction, different response, yeah. different level of faith yep. in receiving. So, how do we receive the word? Yeah, um, that that that's important. So, yeah. I, <laughs> you, you did a great job. You did Praise a great God. job. Let's give him a hand Amen. one more time. Amen. Amen. Um, I mean, that's rich. That's rich. And, and, and I, I recommend to just, you know, maybe go on YouTube or Facebook and share this out and just tell people, just to go, don't, bin, don't binge on Bridgerton. Just checking on some people here. Binge and just do a binge on, on the YouTube channel at, on Wednesday nights. <laughs> the conviction just fell in the room. It was amazing. And, 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 and the last thing I'll say is because when, so in that first verse, when Paul uses the word faithful, he, he could call them faithful because he, 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 he knew the seed he had planted and he knew the soil. And so that's where you see the connection in Acts 20 where he says, I have been faithful. And so he, 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 he laid the foundation there in which, again, those seven churches, the, the multiplying movement came out of. And so it's just incredible. And, and, and when he writes to both Ephesus and Laodicea, what does he say? He that has an ear. Yep, let him hear. There's, a, there's, a, there's one of the messages that goes through the seven churches. Yeah. And all these seven churches, you go, go back and look at chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation because all these churches came out of the church that we're talking about here. And he kept saying, he that has an ear, let him hear what yeah. the Spirit would say to the churches. And I think we're still in the hour, but we have to have an ear to hear what yeah. the Holy Spirit is saying. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and to that, having an ear, I mean, we... Those who don't, they get swept away. He, 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 you know, the Nicolaitans come in. That that Jesus, yeah, it, you know, and so. That's he talks about Alexander and yeah. Hymenius in First Timothy, yep. and they're part of the Church of Ephesus. You know, so yeah, <laughs> they did. They weren't hearing. They were shipwrecked. The yeah. Bible says. So yeah, no, this is good stuff. Thank you, thank you. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Amen.